Yeah, so I see I'm unmuted. I guess this means that we start. A very warm welcome to all of you. I'm very delighted that we have a great number of participants. And I welcome you to the webinar, and that I have to read, you will understand quickly why. Genetic closed kin analysis on white anglerfish for abundance estimates in support of deep fish fisheries management under the common fisheries policy. Fortunately, we have a short name for that, which is Gekka, easy to remember. I call myself, I, my name is Jan Martinson. I'm working for the European Commission, uh, to be exact, for the Joint Research Center. I'm leading a team of 100 colleagues, which take care of scientific support to policies underpinning the governance of freshwater on one hand and the marine realm on the other hand. And one of our core activities is actually the provision of scientific advice to the common fisheries policy. And we will certainly also come to that during our webinar. Well, why are we doing this? Why did we embark on, on GECA? Um, I guess what unifies all of us is an interest in uh, bringing forward at enhancing fisheries management, the management of a natural living resource, a common resource. It's actually quite interesting. It's a common resource, but um, we have on the other hand, the fishers, of course, which really take it out of the sea for us. And fisheries management is very much dependent on fisheries dependent information, catches and landings on one hand, obviously, and also on fisheries independent information, such as um, uh, ca carried out by service and uh, emerging from service like uh, biological data. This feeds into modeling for stock assessments, for example. Obviously, fisheries is very dependent on modeling approaches. And, and this is taking more and more importance also in so-called management strategy evaluation. And this is actually a very interesting component of um, the advice mechanism. It is not our job really to steer the management of the, uh, of the natural common resource fishes in a, in a political societal sense. That's a political and policy decision. Why a management strategy evaluation um, managers Policymakers give us goals that might be the conservation of fish stocks, it might be the protection of certain areas, marine protected areas, for example, but it might also be the insurance of jobs, um, certain profits that should have uh, should be reached. And we can only tell them using our models, well, you can reach within the next years a certain profit margin, but be aware if you do it, then actually your natural resource, your stocks will suffer quite a lot. Now, what is the role of genetic data and information, all that? I think it's fair enough to um, say that um, for many years, um, genetics were acknowledged as potentially very important, valuable for um, the management on conservation of the natural common living resource fish. But on the other hand, it was sort of a parallel world going on. They were the geneticists doing a lot of fascinating, interesting um, work. And they were the sort of classical fishery scientists who were having a very hard job. And actually there was not really a good communication between these two realms, a lot of misunderstandings, really, I think it's fair enough to say a parallel world. And meanwhile, I think this is changing. On one hand, it is still a bit like fishery scientists, they are a bit impatient with geneticists because we come up like every two months saying, well, we have new um, approaches, the costs are declining immensely. On the other hand, it is true also, and we will see examples of that, that genetics are introduced in a more and more efficient way um, into fisheries management and uh, marine governance actually in general. And this brings me to the common fisheries policy. I'm of course, bias, I'm working for the Confish policy, but I also think it's really fascinating what is going on there. The EU member states agreed that the only way to manage and govern a natural um, living resource in the seas, fish, is doing that together, the common fisheries policy. And also the common fisheries policy acknowledges, and this is stipulated in the basic regulation, that it needs best available scientific advice to govern, to manage fisheries in a, in a solid way. So there is no way out of this. The European Union has to apply scientific advice in order to implement the common fisheries policy. That is accompanied by the data collection framework regulation, a law which um, invites the member states to collect fisheries and aquaculture data to support the scientific advice mechanism that is um, accommodated by the common fisheries policy. Now, where is the genetic data in that? 
actually partly it is already used again we will have examples when it comes to the data collection framework regulation there is no consistent collection of genetic data yet and we can certainly discuss why that is so but actually there are sporadic examples even for that um, member state level for this and this brings me now to Gecker. A few years ago, CSIRO of Australia was visiting the Joint Research Centre and they were presenting this fascinating project on um, bluefin tuna. They apparently used genetic data markers in order to get uh, to abundance estimates of bluefin tuna. And my team and I, we were really um, flabbergasted. We said, wow, this is fantastic. And we were thinking, how can we test this system actually? What would be a good species to start with? I have to say I'm also at the moment the chair of the ICES working group on applied genetics for fisheries and aquaculture and we introduced this topic into this very nice group of scientists and we made a term of reference on it and re reflected on how can we actually use this um, close kin analysis and we decided a very interesting um, group of species would be deep sea species because they have obviously management issues there. And after some discussion and evaluation, we decided to go for white anglerfish. And this is how it all started. And then fortunately, due to our um, connaissance also with ATSTI, their involvement also in, um, in ISIS, we managed to bring up the project GECA. And you will hear more about this and what, what this is all about. This is how it all started. Now we will now start with um, a nice series of presentations. Uh, we will hear something about fisheries management uh, globally, the role of scientific advice, how it feeds into and underpins fisheries management. And of course, also we will discuss the current and future potential of genetic information with a focus on Gecko. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that we have a very nice feature here. We will actually pop up with uh, opinion, kind of opinion polls during this talk. And I would really like to invite you to enter these polls. We will work on this webinar after we have finished and we use the, your answers also actually to evaluate what was going on during the webinar. There's also, um, uh, a chat function, but generally I have to say the audience, and I will belong to the audience very quickly, will be muted. But there is a chat function which you should use in order to challenge us with questions. I introduced myself already, so that is done. We have um, other speakers, participants, you see them here on the screen actually. It is a great pleasure to introduce Marina Sunturtun. She's responsible for uh, scientific uh, sustainable fisheries research in ATSTI. Then we have Nayara Rodriguez Espeleta. She's a senior researcher at ASTI and she's really at the core of GECA. She's the leader of GECA and does a fantastic job uh, in that. But she's also the incoming chair. She, she will replace me as the chair next year of the ISIS Working Group on Applied Genetics for Fisheries and Aquaculture. Then we have, um, uh, and actually, what, what I, um, then we have Agotzane uh, Urtiz Perea from ATSTI again. And she is actually, and this um, I think um, demonstrates really the broad scope of the GECA project, which is very nice. She is the stock coordinator for white anglerfish on one hand. Um, but apart from anglerfish, she's also, yeah, she has a huge research interest in um, immersive fisheries and tropical tuna. And what I think is a great added value, she's also involved in the fisheries library based on our FLR. We have also, as you can see, Antonella Zanzi. She's a very dear colleague of mine um, and helps me a lot. She's a scientific project officer of the Joint Research Center. And she has a very unique and for me really precious background because at the same time, she's an, a fishery scientist and expert in fisheries dependent information data. She's responsible for that under the data collection framework regulation. She has an IT background. She's a very efficient programmer. And she is also a biologist with a genetic background, which is really uh, absolutely great. And then last but not least, I would also uh, point out that we are supported by Merixel Gonzalez. I excuse actually for my pronunciation of these Basque names. It's probably horrible. Um, she's also a st ATSI staff member and really she provides tremendous support to the organization of this event here. And she's really the director of the show and we are in, in her hands. With this, I would like to pass on to the first speaker, Marina. And actually I would like to invite you to enjoy our webinar and really to participate both through the chats and also through the polls. Have fun. Thank you, Jan. Um, I think that now I have to share my screen. 
but I'm not sure. Maritel, are you there? I'm here. There's the poll okay. now on the screen, so people is answering our poll. Okay, good. We gave some seconds to get the answers. And we will start with your with your presentation, Marina. I will connect your your screen. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Well, many questions. Thank you all for your answers. Okay, so I will start now with my presentation. Uh, my name is Marina Santurtun. I'm responsible for Sustainable Fisheries Management Research Area in ASTI. I'm going to do a brief presentation about fisheries management in general, but uh, I will focus a little bit more on, on ICES, which is the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, which is the advisor body for the European Commission. So I will start with something very easy. Uh, what is actually fisheries management? What do we understand by fisheries management? Okay, I have taken this uh, definition from Cochrane, uh, from the FAO organization from 2002, and uh, fisheries management is defined as an integrated process. Okay, that's very important, integrated process of information gathering, analysis, planning, consultation, decision making, allocation of resources and formulation and implementation of regulation or rules which govern fisheries activities in order to ensure the continued productivity of the resources and the accomplishment of other fisheries objectives. This is the definition of the fisheries management, okay? So based on this definition, why actually do we need to manage fisheries? Why do we need it? Well, it's clear that we need it because we need to ensure that the resources are use are utilized in a sustainable way and in a responsible way and of course we don't have to forget that the resources we need to to get from them the potential benefits in in an efficient way okay that's an important part also of the definition of why we need to manage resources okay with these two definitions in our minds and we, because we were saying that the fisheries management is an integrated process, we need to take into consideration many things. Jan was uh, commented a little bit in the introduction. So this uh, complex and integrated process, it has to include all these kinds of considerations. Uh, of course, uh, biological considerations. So we need to look at the resources. If we think about fish, we need to think about growth, about reproduction, uh, if we think about uh, another kind of consideration, ecological or environmental, we have to take into account how fish or resources are into the ecosystem, how they relate with the environment. We need to consider also how uh, fisheries extract fish from the sea. Uh, so these are the technological considerations about the gears they are used. We also have some uh, considerations, social and cultural, Fisheries in Spain are not the same as the fisheries in Ireland. The social and cultural baggage of each of the communities make that the fisheries uh, um, differ from one to another place. And this is important consideration. We also need to consider also the economic aspect of the fisheries. Of course, fisheries are economic activities. So the economics are, to, are in the base of the fisheries management. And then we have another kind of considerations, like considerations imposed by other parties, other countries, other areas, and so on. So this integrated process and this complex process has to take into account all these considerations, okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about one of them, which is an important one, the first ones, the biological and ecological considerations, which are the ones very related to the genetic tools that we want to talk in this seminar, okay? Uh, 
when we talk about fishery resources and we go, when we talk about managing fisheries, we think about units of, of pools of uh, fish or resources that we need to manage. Okay, and that that is where it comes the definition of fish stocks. So fish stocks are defined as uh, living resources in a community or population from which catches are taken in a fisheries. So the definition of fish stock is a very fishery oriented definition. Okay? This term, the fish stock, usually implies that the particular population that we are exploiting, that we are catching, we are extracting from, from the system, is more or less as isolated from other stocks of the same species and is in some ways self-sustaining. Okay? So we know the population, we know that it's a fish stock, and we know that the whole process occurs into those limits of the fish stock. Okay? But its uh, definitions are okay, but uh, they are far away from the reality. Okay? Uh, this map that I saw you on the left is the ISIS area map. The ISIS area is all this, well, I have skipped another part in here in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is the ISIS area, okay? The ISIS area is divided for management purposes, is divided in different sub areas and different divisions, okay? So this is the puzzle that we have in the ISIS area. So when we talk about the good definition of the fish stocks and the good, and the good management and assessment, uh, we have to think that uh, the management of the fish stock are not uh, usually in, in coherence with the actual uh, limitation or distribution of the stocks. Why? Well, there are many reasons. Uh, there are reasons, simply reasons of that we don't have enough knowledge for defining the limits of the stocks. Okay, this is an anglerfish, a white anglerfish. Anglerfish are distributed all along this area, so from 4 to 9a. So the reasons for defining the stocks is, uh, well, we don't have very clear the limits of the, of the stocks, okay? There are other reasons, there are more uh, practical, practicabilities, pra practical reasons for dividing stocks in one boundary or in another, because there are reasons that uh, are used, such as historical rights of some countries in fishing in some areas, okay? Or, and there are other reasons that are more uh, practical reasons like administrative or political reasons. For instance, the division of some of the stocks in here in the, in the waters surrounding the Iberian Peninsula, it was done when actually Spain in, entered into the uh, European Economic Community, the, the European Union. Okay, this was in, uh, this was in 1986. At that time, this part it was not considered of any assessment or management. And when we enter, uh, the stocks in here in this area were divided into separate stocks from the others. Okay, so the limits of the stocks are not clear. Uh, the limits of the stocks are defined based on many reasons apart from biological reasons. There could be political reasons, administrative reasons, reasons to facilitate the management historical reasons and, uh, and, and others, okay? So I think that in here is where we need to think about methodologies that can help to, if it's the case, try to reorganize or, or re, um, redraw this, this map of the distribution of the stocks. Okay, I'll go a bit further now, okay. So as I was telling you, I was going to show you an example of how fisheries are managed in the European Union, Union in the context of the ISIS, okay? Um, well, uh, the first thing that we have is that the, we have the International Council of the Exploration of the Sea, in which uh, there are different groups of uh, or different yes different groups we have the assessment working groups and we have the advisory committees okay here is where all the science the scientists and independent experts who review the work of the scientists 
down the advice on the quantities that can be cut year by year for all the stocks di distributed in the ISIS area. Okay. So on one hand, we have the ISIS International uh, International Council of the Exploration of the Sea, ISIS, and we also have the General Fisheries Commission for the Mediterranean. I'm not going to talk about this, okay? But it's part also of the of the same process. So what does ISIS do? Uh, actually, it does a management recommendation on that on TNC total allowable, allowable catch technical measures, and it also gives advice to managers in relation to environmental issues. Also, it gives advice to, to national governments sometimes and uh, to other international organizations. Okay, this is the first the first step in the in the management. Okay. So ISIS, ISIS gives advice to the European Commission. Okay. Uh, we got another body, which is the Scientific Techn Technical and Economic Committee for Fisheries, STCF, which is also composed by independent scientists and experts, and which also can give um, additional technical and economic advice and recommendations and, and, and do uh, proposals and assess proposals coming from the European Commission. Okay, so there is another scientific body in there that contributes to and assist the, the European Commission to the preparation uh, of legislative proposals or delegate acts, policies, initiatives, and so on. Okay? In the same way, the European uh, Commission uh, asked this body, the SDCF, uh, to consult a group on matters such as the marine fisheries biology, fishing gears, economics, and so on. Okay, uh, you see that there is another body in here, which are the advisory councils, the ACs. Okay, this is a this is a body that is composed mainly by stakeholders, producers, industry, marketers, and so on. I have included here. The whole list of all the ACs that are actually in the European Union, and all of these give uh, have consultations and give uh, recommendations to the European Commission. Okay. Um, this uh, this group is divided by 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 things by by experts like aquaculture by issues, or it can be divided also by by regional seas. Okay. Black, uh, Baltic Sea, Black Sea, Southwestern Waters, and so on. Okay, if we keep going with the fisheries uh, management process, then we have the European Parliament, which at this moment is at the same level as the European Commission. Okay, and from here, once we got the uh, the advice of TACs to the European Commission. Other advice that can enrich this advice from TAC from the STCF. We have the consultations with the advisory councils. Then from here we have the proposal of regulation of TSCs, quotas, and other issues like the landing obligation, uh, control regulation, and so on. Okay, all this advice that has been worked along this all this process goes into the Council of Ministers at the end of the year. And finally, what we got is the decision, directives and the regulations. Basically, the TAC that are annually approved in December that are the fishing possibilities that are to be used by the countries and fleets for the following year. Okay. Well, here you see that there is this box, which is the European Fisheries Control Agency and the member states. Okay, with the role of this, oh, sorry, going back. The role of this uh, uh, control agency and the member states is the, of course, the role of the members are the implementation of the decision directives and regulation and the control of the, and the control of, of all these, of the common fisheries policies. Okay, so this is the process, which is, um, I have tried to simplify, but <laughs> it's complex. <laughs> Um, um, but well, this is how it proceeds. Okay, so something that is important that is uh, taken from the definition, the first de definitions that we got on fisheries management, is that we have in here represented all the important wording of the definition. 
we got the information gathering, which is actually here, the analysis, planning, consultation, decision making, allocation of resources, formulation and implementation. All this wording is represented in the, in the fisheries management process in Europe. Okay. Just to show you more in more detail in here, I'm focusing on the scientists. You see that the scientists occupy a big part of the of the process. Well, maybe I have, the boxes are very big because I am a scientist and I'm putting a, a big weight on scientists in, in the process. But I think really that the scientists have a big a big weight in the in the whole process of uh, fisheries management. Okay, um, and. And yes, we are mostly in most part of the of the process of the chain here in this part where we have the most scientific bodies giving advice. Here also in the advisory countries, uh, councils where the stakeholders are are leading them, the scientists are we are also present. Here in this technical uh, committee, we are of course present. Uh, so in one important part of the process, we are represented. Okay. In fact, we are part of the information gathering, analysis, planning and consultation. Something that is very important is to, to, to say and to stress is that the fisheries management procedure in Europe is a standardized process. Okay? So when we talk about all this process, uh, which is, it seems complex, it's all standardized. It all follows, um, uh, follows a link of, of thought. It all follows a, a reason for doing it. It, had, it follows process, uh, the same standardized uh, process in methods. For instance, in the data collection framework is a regulation that all the European countries follow and we all do the sampling in the same way under the same method, under the same objectives of variability, under the same concept of materials and so on. So there is an, a standardized process. We do, we do things year by year under the same timing, so there are defined times of the year that we do the same assessment, we do the consultancy, we do the reviews and so on. We follow the same procedures, we have the same roles well defined, the, compos the composition of the bodies are well defined uh, and the roles are very clear. So this is a process that is quite well standardized. Okay? I was saying again that using these words of the of the definition, we can see that again all of them are represented in the process. I was commenting on the scientists, information gathering, analysis, planning, consultation. We got the consultation around here, the decision making and the formulation is around here. And all, of course, the member states have an important role in the planning, consultation, allocation of resources, implementation of the rules and the enforcement. Okay. So everything is represented in here. Okay, so after all this process, <laughs> uh, which is the role that the science and the knowledge have in the process? Okay. Um, well, I was saying to you that uh, it, it occupies, science occupies a big, very big part of the process. Okay. But how uh, does it have to be the science to be useful to the, to the purpose of the, of the efficient management? So uh, I think that the, the, the science has to be uh, well established in the context. The science has to be contextualized first in the process. So this is it has to be visible in the process, and also it has to be um, it has to be uh, directed towards the actual and future problems. Okay. So science has to be contextualized in the in the moment that we are living now and prevent uh, uh, prospecting in the future. Okay, this is important because uh, pr I think that actually the, the, the answers that we are giving uh, actually probably they are more related to the past than to the actual reality of the of the context of the reality that surrounds science, physical science. I'm talking about. So it's important that we are in uh, contextualized in this in the actual moment and always looking at the future. Uh, science also uh, have to be focused, focus on the needs of the society. Okay, so always thinking on the uh, construction of new knowledge. The construction of the new knowledge is a co-production between the science and the policy, between the science and the society. We cannot get away from the society. I mean, this, uh, the science 
needs to penetrate the society and the society also needs to penetrate science. So we need to give answer, focus on the what the society are demanding at this moment and in the future, of course. So in this way, science would need to be commissioned to adapt to a changing environments. Okay. When we are talking about these new genetic tools, uh, okay, uh, we need to think, okay, this is new, we need to adapt to them. Are they going to be useful? Do we think that they, they are useful? Uh, probably yes, when we were talking about the first question about the definition of the stocks, how stocks are limited. Genetics, are, Nayara is going to show you, are proved to be a very uh, efficient and, and, and cost-efficient uh, uh, tool. To define to define stocks, okay. So science, we need to adapt ourselves to the changing environment. Environment understood as this process of fisheries management, and also uh, environment understood that natural environment and in the disciplines and in the expertise that we we work with, okay. So we need to adapt to climate change, population distributions. New tools as genetics, new tools as big, as big data, new fishing techniques, and so on. Okay, because the, of the, always the idea is to be useful to the society and to the contractors, which actually are the society. Okay, and at last, uh, we have to think that the science we need to be cost efficiency. Okay, uh, if we are included in the whole process of fisheries management. Uh, we are more directly concerned about the cost and about the impact of the things that we do. Okay, so it's important to be efficient. Um, it's important to be adaptive to the new methodologies, to the new questions that are rising from the society. And I think that this is well. Genetics offer all uh, all this. It appears to be efficient, it appears to be rigorous, it appears to be adapted to the new times. And of course, it will give us uh, answers to questions that are, are going to come in the next future. Okay, and with this, I will finish my presentation. And now you're going to show in your screens uh, one of these uh, poll questions. I don't know if you can see it now. Let me check. Yes, the poll is already open. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, while this poll is opened, um, I will start introducing my presentation. I think we will leave it for a few minutes. Uh, I guess everyone is still there. Um, you can hear me well. Um, so, um, I'm going to start sharing my screen, I think, um, soon. If I manage to do it. Yes. Now I think you can see me and soon you will be able to see my screen. But I cannot do this, Mary. I think you have to do it for me. Ah, now. Yeah. I think everyone can see now my screen. Yes. Can anybody say something so that I can start? Yes. Okay. Fine, Good. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, yes. Um, so thanks to all for, for being here today. Um, it's a great pleasure that we can uh, talk about these very exciting uh, new, not so new, but new applications of this uh, field of research. So I've been working on genetics for almost 20 years now, uh, applied to a variety of systems, to a variety of organisms, and I have had the privilege to live the, what we call the genetic revolution, right? So before, uh, what is it? Why is it called the genetic revolution? Before genetics was reserved to, uh, or at least high throughput genetics and genomic studies were reserved to uh, model organisms such as a mouse, human, of course, uh, the fruit fly, zebra fish, and so on. But with the new generation of uh, sequencing techniques and uh, the advent of these, these techniques, 
uh, we can say that genetics has been a, a bit democratized, so it's now accessible uh, to many uh, research laboratories. And this means that it can be applied to um, what we call non-model system, non-model organisms. Uh, so this has opened the avenue to answer a lot of uh, ecological questions uh, that, is, that are very relevant for conservation and resource management. And of course, uh, fisheries is, um, is a system that can benefit a lot for the advent of genetic um, techniques. Obviously, genetics doesn't come alone. It comes with a lot of challenges to be solved, uh, such as, for example, bioinformatics. So computing is a big thing in genetics now because we need a lot of um, uh, computing power and, and to develop new algorithms to analyze the data we now have and also because it presents a lot of uh, in, when we want to use genetics for conservation and management we need to make sure that uh, we communicate well with um, scientists between scientists and um, policy makers stakeholders and so on so this is seminar aims to address all those questions so I'm going to start with a brief uh, introduction and some examples where of where genetics can help us and then I'm going to uh, talk uh, deeper into the results we got from the GIGA project. So the good thing about working on D with DNA is that all organisms have DNA. Um, so we can standardize and do uh, analysis a si similar way in very different organisms. Um, so the DNA, you know, it's just four letters, right? It seems like a very simple thing, but there are so many letters and millions of them that combine, they provide a lot of information on the past, the present, and the future of the organisms. Uh, so the genetic uh, information is inherited from parents to children, but also it can suffer some alterations, mutations that can be beneficial, or can be deleterious, or can be neutral. So depending on what is the benefit or non-benefit that those mutations provide, they will get fixed in the population or they will disappear, they will be inherited and so on. So the good thing is that all this information is contained in the genome of the organisms. And if we are able to extract this information, we, are, we will be able to learn a lot about uh, what has happened to a species or a population, what is happening right now and what potentially will happen under different scenarios. So here I listed six actions that we can do uh, using genetic techniques and that are relevant for um, fisheries management. So we can distinguish species or populations. We can assign individuals to species or populations. We can count individuals. I will talk a little bit in more detail on that. We can detect presence of species in different environments. We can connect the species within each other by analyzing, for example, trophic webs. And we can also predict uh, potential behavior of the different species or communities to changes. Okay, so let's start by distinguish. Um, so one of the most straightforward applications of genetics to fisheries management is the definition of management units or uh, stocks. And this has to be done uh, by uh, using some kind of biological knowledge, right? So as Marina mentioned before, our current definition of stock sometimes doesn't um, follow any biological meaning or genetic uh, meaning. So it comes from historical, political reasons, and so on. Uh, but do those uh, stock definitions in most of the species um, follow a biological meaning? So here I will show you the example of uh, the Hague. This is a study we did last year uh, where we checked if the current stock definition if in Hague, which is divided in the southern stock and the northern stock, you can see it here, so northern stock and southern stock. So we decided to check if this stock definition followed um, some kind of um, a genetic meaning, right? So we took samples from the northern stock, the southern part of the northern stock and the northern part of the northern stock from the southern stock and also from the Mediterranean Sea. So as you can see here, so we did this PCA where samples are grouped according to how uh, similar they are within each other um, uh, concerning using their, their genome. And uh, you can see that the southern part, so the Bay of Biscay here of the northern stock and the southern stock they cannot be distinguished within each other, so they are very similar. And you can see that the southern part of the northern stock and the northern part of the northern stock are very different within each other. So almost as different as this uh, area from the Mediterranean Sea. 
So what does this mean in terms of assessment and management? Well, it, it means that we are considering as two different populations something that should be considered one and that we are separating uh, into um, two populations something that should be uh, sorry we are separating into two stocks something that is belonging to one population and that we are mixing together into a single stock two uh, communities or two populations that are clearly differentiated so this uh, now we are working on trying to see where the stock boundary should be located and we will see if we can come with alternative uh, scenarios that we can test to see if the assessment of the species uh, can can be more accurate using this new definition of stocks Another study or another thing we can do using genetics is to assign origin, right? So uh, in the case I presented before, we have different populations that can be distinguished within each other genetically. We can have other cases where we, where we have different um, populations that are differentiated, but that mix at certain point uh, during their lifetime. For example, this, uh, this is very common. Um, this is something that is very known in in salmon right where they go to rivers and then uh they mix in the sea uh, and they, they belong to different populations where in the case of bluefin tuna something similar happens so in bluefin tuna we have two main spawning grounds one in the mediterranean and one in the gulf of mexico and the thing is that we know that individuals born in each of those spawning grounds can uh, go to the other side of the atlantic but in terms of management until now, um, the way we were doing it is that um, whatever was caught in the east of this imaginary line, which is located in the uh, minus 45 uh, meridian, uh, whatever was caught in the east of this line was considered the eastern stock, and whatever was caught in the west of this line was considered the western stock. Knowing that some, or, some individuals caught, caught here could have been born in the Mediterranean Sea. Using genetics, we can uh, we have developed a tool where we can assign individuals to their uh, place of origin, where they were born. So we applied this tool that we, we developed and published, and we saw actually that uh, the way we were doing it uh, was not very accurate because we were considering um, part of the Western stock individuals that were actually uh, caught here, but that were born in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, in this case, genetics helps us assigning individuals to origin from uh, mixed um, mixed stock fisheries. And this is um, a real application of genetics in this case, because this tool that we have developed is actually uh, being used by ICAT, which is the organism that uh, does the assessment of the bluefin tuna. Also, before I continue, I forgot to mention that here I have indicated the organisms that have funded each of those research I'm talking about so that uh, I don't forget to acknowledge them. Uh, another thing we can do with genetics is to count kin relationships. And this is very interesting for uh, determining uh, the abundance of the population. So determining the reproductive stock uh, biomass. And this is done by using a technique that you may have heard of it because it's very um, popular this day, so it's called the Close Kin Mark Recapture or CKMR. So this is this the technique uh, follows a very simple principle by which uh, the more related individuals you find in a population, the smaller this population is, right? So if we imagine those two uh, populations of which we don't know the size, so this imagine that this is covered, we don't see the inside of those tanks. Uh, and we sample the same number of individuals for each. So we sample, for example, four adults and four juveniles. The chances that you, we will get relative pairs, so related pairs, parents and children, in the small population is higher than in the big population. So by counting the number of pairs we find in each of the cases, we can make an estimation of how the population, how big the population is, right? So um, obviously this, this uh, technique seems to be based on a very simple principle, but its application requires adaptation to each of the case study and each of the species because it considers and takes into account a lot of parameters that are specific to each species. And I will come back 
to this a little bit later when I talk uh, when I talk about the white anglerfish. Um, another thing we can do with genetics, and this is another of the terms that you may have been been hearing these days, um, I guess, is the environmental DNA. So sampling environmental DNA is a new tool that has uh, very promising avenues in fisheries management. So eDNA stands for the uh, material that is um, collected from the environment uh, that comes from shedding uh, from uh, the animals that inhabit this environment. Uh, for example, uh, the, some cells or tissues or mucus and feces, some material that the organisms leave uh, while they pass through seawater, for example. So by collecting seawater, small amount of seawater, in this case, I'm talking just about two to five liters of seawater, we can have an overview of the organisms that inhabit that environment. It may seem very surprising, but it, it's a method that it actually works quite well. And this is an example of a study we did. So where we collected water samples from the Bay of Biscay and also um, catches. So it was a survey that is, is a Bioman survey that we do every year. So we introduced the eDNA sampling um, since 2017. And we compare the um, species that we found using eDNA and uh, using the catches. And as you can see here, uh, well, we found the most common species were common between the two uh, methods. The eDNA was able to, to recover many more species. So we had like more than 100 species using eDNA and I was uh, 20 or so using catches. And uh, we also had some species that were found in catches and not in eDNA. And we discussed this in the, in the paper we published. So there are some explanations for it. The most common being that those species are not present in the reference database that we use to compare uh, our DNA sequences to uh, the taxonomy. So this is something that can be solved. It's a technical problem. Uh, and another amazing thing that we found is that there is a correlation between the number of reads of genetic sequences we get from each of the species um, to compare to the uh, biomass of each of the species that we get from the catches. So there is some abundance estimation that can be derived from the uh, environmental DNA data. Um, so I will not discuss more about this uh, this um, subject in this presentation, but uh, we are working on it uh, in different systems, rivers, estuaries and oceans. So perhaps there will be another webinar on this. Um, we will we will notice if that's the case. Um, another thing we can do uh, with genetics is to connect species within each other. So we can uh, connect predator and prey. Uh, and this is very important to understand the trophic web. So as you may see in this uh, not very nice picture, um, analyzing the stomach content of a fish uh, or any other animal actually uh, can be very complicated. So taxonomic identification in, uh, in semi-degraded prey or prey from different uh, very uh, small or uh, small life stages uh, can be very complicated. So we can use genetics to uh, see, uh, to assign or make the taxonomy of this uh, stomach content. For that aim, what we simply do is to make a, a puree of the uh, stomach and then we extract the DNA. And then what we can do is that we can find a specific species in that uh, mix of DNA, or we can make the inventory of all the species we find. In the first case, um, we will do it to see uh, which are the predators that feed on a particular prey. And in the second case, we would be interested in what is the diet of a particular predator, right? Uh, this is the, sec the one example of the results we would get for the second case. So we get uh, the diet composition of the different species we are interested in. And this is uh, in terms of fisheries management, of course, this is very interesting to uh, estimate natural mortality and to fit multi-specific models. We can also have uh, interest for ecosystem models and indicators of good, good environmental status, for sure. Um, obviously, this method has some drawbacks. Uh, it cannot detect cannibalism. It cannot distinguish between developmental stages. And it cannot distinguish prey of prey. But it has also very advan advantages that, shouldn't be, uh, that should be considered. So it's a method that is relatively cheap, fast, and scalable. 
It does not require taxonomic expertise. Uh, it performs accurate identification in digested prey, and it performs accurate ident identification also in early life stages. Um, and finally, um, the, the last uh, action I wanted to talk to you about before I go to present the GECA project is to the, the ability of predicting adaptation that we can do using genetics. And here are two uh, cartoon-like examples, but I think it, it, they illustrate well what we can do by analyzing, by analyzing genetic diversity. So here in those um, bubbles, so you have the left one, which co would correspond to a large population that has a very low genetic diversity. So this was mean, would mean that this population would be very easily affected by a change. So all the individuals would be equally affected by a change and the likelihood of this population to survive is very low. However, even if the population is smaller, if the genetic diversity within the population is high, this means that the individuals will have some genetic um, background to develop new adaptation mechanism to that change. So more or less, we can say that the genetic diversity would be um, uh, would, would have will will give us an idea of how resilient that population is. And another thing we can study also by um, uh, using genetics uh, concerning a potential adaptation to changes is uh, to look for specific signals of adaptation of uh, different species of a, to a particular uh, change. So in this case, it's a very nice study where they checked uh, signals of adaptation uh, to higher or lower to lower or higher temperatures of different species in the uh, eastern coast of uh, Canada and US. And they found some patterns where, uh, and, and they could define like a, um, a climb, a climb uh, where uh, in, the, in the north part and the south part, the allelic frequency of some genetic markers were different, meaning that the populations in those two regions were adapting to temperature differently. So this is the first part of the presentation. And uh, now I think you will get a, a pull question uh, where we would like you to uh, answer, do you think that the potential of genetics is fully exploited for fisheries management? So um, now, uh, while this pool is open, um, I'm going to start talking about the GECA project. Um, is, is the project uh, Jan was introducing uh, before. So the title of, of the project is Genetic Close Skin Analysis of White Anglerfish for Abundance Estimates in Support of the Deep Sea Fisheries Management under the Commission Fisheries Policy. And I think we can, uh, I can start sharing my screen again. Yeah. I think, it's, no, it's my screen shared now. Yes, yes go. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, this is the... Sorry, I need to find the presentation again. Yes. Okay, so the GECA project uh, is uh, a project that is being uh, conducted in collaboration with ASTI, the University of Salford, and the European Commission. So it started a little bit more than two years ago, and we are about to finish um, next month. So uh, we got a budget of 97,000 euros, and obviously, um, a big part of the project will be to communicate the results. So we've been doing this communication uh, as usually scientists do, so through scientific papers, international conferences, and we also have a website. But we really want this project to reach 
uh, the um, audience that can most benefit of these results, which is uh, uh, the managers and stakeholders. So we started by presenting this to the ISIS working group, doing the um, assessment of uh, the white anglerfish. And now we are doing this webinar and we, we will probably be uh, presenting this uh, in other forum as well. So the two main objectives of, um, of um, GECA were to establish the genetic population structure of white anglerfish and to provide the baseline for application of the close kin mar recapture for abundance estimation. I come back to the close kin mar recapture again. So I remember you that this method consists on counting pairs of related individuals to make an estimation of the size of the population. It's a method that uh, it has not only been uh, proven theoretically, so it has been actually applied uh, to the southern bluefin tuna fully, uh, where the estimates obtained are more optimistic than those obtained uh, from the um, catch per unit effort. And also it is a method that has been under consideration for uh, other species. Uh, but applying, as I said before, applying the Koloskin mar recapture to species is not straightforward and it needs that we go step by step and that we uh, answer some questions one after the other until we can actually develop the model, the statistical model, to apply the Koloskin mar recapture method. So one of the first things uh, that we need to check is, is the species breeding biology appropriate, right? There are some species that are just not eligible to be um, to be analyzed using close skin mar recapture. So, uh, for example, in this uh, schema, uh, it is shown that some species that have some breeding uh, behavior uh, that is quite particular, they, that they are not eligible for close skin mar recapture. Also, uh, for some superabundant and long, long, short longevity species, the method can also not be applied. But actually, in this case, for the white anglerfish, which is the species we are interested in, uh, it's a species that it has a moderate longevity and a high fecundity. So it's actually uh, eligible for close kin mar recapture. So in that sense, the first step uh, would be a pass in our case. The second thing that we need to check is, is there enough biological knowledge available? So developing the close kin mar recapture statistical model requires that this model needs to be fed with uh, some biological knowledge about the species. So we need to know if that, if that knowledge is actually available. So some of some examples of thing we, things we would need are, for example, the proportion of mature individuals per age class, the effect of size on reproductive output, the fecundity, the longevity, the sex ratio. And then for each individual samples we analyze, uh, we need to estimate the age and sometimes also sex is required. In the case of uh, white anglerfish, uh, this knowledge is available. Uh, there are some questions about probably the age because we have to estimate it through length or weight, but we can also uh, introduce those uncertainties in the model afterwards. So in that case, we can say that we do have enough biological knowledge available. Sampling logistics is also important. So we need to know if there is a sampling logistics in place and if it is appropriate. So in the case of, I will come back to this a little bit later, but uh, in the case of the white anglerfish, uh, there are annual surveys that uh, are done. There is also commercial um, operations on these species. So we have the feeling that the logistics is in place and appropriate, although I will come back with a more quantitative evaluation on this a little bit later. Um, this, I'm going to stop here a little bit in this, in this box. So genetic population structure. We need to know the genetic population structure because we need to apply the close skin mark recapture um, in uh, a population. So we need to know if the region to which we are going to apply the closed mark capture is connected within each other or if it's composed by different populations or not. So this information is mandatory before we apply the closed mark recapture model. And actually, this is most of the activities that we've been working on in the GIGA project. So in the case of the white anglerfish, uh, we have uh, several stocks but we don't know if those stocks are genetically connected or if they are genetically isolated. So this is what we want to answer in, in, in this part of the project. So um, you will hear, um, I anticipate that you will hear about mislabeling and hybridization. So um, quite interesting results that we found unexpectedly. 
So this is the, our, our sampling design. So we uh, did a sampling, we did a study that um, included almost 700 Lophius piscatorius, which is the white anglerfish samples, and 31 black anglerfish. So we included the black anglerfish uh, because it's a very closely related species. So we wanted to have it as an outgroup. And um, the samples were provided by uh, different institutions to which I'm um, really grateful because uh, without these samples, it would have been impossible to do the study. And the, uh, some, the specimens were identified according to the color of the peritoneum. So it is uh, well established that the color of the peritoneum is a diagnostic characteristic to tell us if we are talking about a white or a black anglerfish. This is more confusing in the juveniles but in the adults, it's quite clear. And the data we are using on SNPs, you may have heard of those. Um, they are single nucleotide polymorphisms, so sequence variation that occur within a species. And we can, if they are inherited, and we can use them to check the, relat the uh, relatedness between the different individuals. In this case, we are using nuclear SNPs, as shown here. They come from the mother and from the father. But in the cells, there is also information from the mitochondria, which in most species comes from the mother. In this case, we're using nuclear SNPs. So for this, the study of, with the SNPs, we have almost 17,000 17, SNPs from 325 individuals. And here's the results we obtain. And I will walk you through this result um, so that you can understand it very well. This is a PCA. Um, where the organisms, the individuals are uh, grouped according to how similar they are. Here, uh, you don't see it very well, but there's a lot of dots, one on top of the other. Same thing here and same thing here. Here, there are only two dots and here there are three dots. What is interesting is that this grouping in those three main groups and those two other groups does not follow any geographical uh, explanation. So. We have in this group individuals from the four areas analyzed. We have here individuals from three of the four areas analyzed. And we have here individuals from three of the four areas analyzed, including the black anglerfish samples. In these other two other groups, we have only individuals from the northern stock. So in summary, what we see is that this group, the Lophius Budegasa, the black anglerfish, is only contained in this group, but the white anglerfish samples, the Lophius piscatorius samples, are contained in all the groups that we see in the PCA analysis. This is with the nuclear SNPs. The mitochondrial DNA has been used in the past to distinguish the two species. So there is an, an assay that has been developed based on the mitochondrial DNA that is supposed to tell us if uh, an individual is a white or a black anglerfish. What we see is a very similar pattern. The black anglerfish samples, they all follow the black anglerfish pattern that was uh, published as a di diagnostic character, but the white anglerfish samples have both the white and the black uh, anglerfish pattern. So basically what we can conclude for this result is that when we receive a sample, that is supposed to be a white anglerfish, we are actually receiving some black anglerfish. So we can think that this is a misidentification, but I have to say that all those samples were collected by scientists working in anglerfish for years. And I mean, and, and all the anglerfish were opened because their, um, their maturity stage and everything was checked. So they, I will be very surprised that they would have given us um, a black peritoneum uh, sample as a white anglerfish. So our conclusion is that the peritoneum is probably not a valid diagnostic feature, but also we are getting some individuals that seem to have an intermediate uh, genetic signature between the black and the white anglerfish, which means that they could be actually hybrids. What is interesting is that the, all the samples that were provided to us as black anglerfish have turned to be black, but we only have 31. So that's why I say so far. Um, so as I said before, we had the feeling that we may be having hybrids between the two species. And actually that's the case. So, so we can test for presence of hybrids 
using um, uh, a program that is uh, done, developed to do so. So what we find is that the group in the middle is actually uh, composed by those first generation hybrids. So one parent of each species and that the two groups in the, in the uh, um, two sides of this middle group are actually composed by what we call back crosses, which would be uh, individuals that are, have a hybrid as a parent and a pure individual as the other parent. Um, interestingly, uh, most of the hybrid and back crosses has, have as a mother a black anglerfish and a father a white anglerfish, and only three of them have as a mother a white anglerfish. So um, we, we saw actually that we have hybrids and they, that we also have misidentified individuals. So where are those um, three types of uh, individuals we see uh, distributed? Are they equally distributed within the uh, area of the species or are they concentrated uh, in different places? So here you can see uh, the distribution per stock and including the Mediterranean also. So the most, uh, the, the misidentified individuals, mislabeled individuals are mostly present in the Mediterranean and the southern stock and the hybrids are mostly present in the northern and northern platform stocks. If we um, do the uh, distribution separating the areas a little bit more, so we can see, well, Mediterranean stays the same, but we can see that the misidentified individuals remain really in the southern part of the southern stock and the hybrid individuals are located all within this area. So there is no hybrids, no misidentification in uh, the North Sea. This is quite interesting. So what's going on with the hybrids, right? So in order to see uh, why we should consider, how we should consider them for a stock assessment, um, we, we need to know what these hybrids are doing. Are they really reproducing? Or if they are reproducing, are they reproducing as good as the non-hybrids and so on, right? So the question is, how old are hybrids? So have hybrids been happening since always, almost? But, but because they are not fit enough, they just cannot uh, reproduce and they are just there, so like a hybrid zone. Or are they really doing something that can shape the future of the white and black anglerfish? So if the hybrids are actually old, we can assume that if no changes occur, they will remain doing what they have been doing so far, right? So they will just be there and not really affect much the two species. Stable hybrid zone, we call it. However, if they are recent, it means that things could be changing so things could be changing. That means one of the explanations could be the same one as before, right? So we remain in a stable hybrid zone, but there are two other explanations. One, that the two species will disappear and we will finish with the hybrid. So the two species at, at some point will be all mixed and we will not have black or white anglerfish or that a new species originates. We don't know, we don't have any tool right now uh, to uh, see what's going on. Uh, one of the things that we could do would be to monitor uh, these species and the hybrids in uh, cross years and, and see what's the evolution. And then uh, another thing that we also wanted to see, to see if, the, uh, if we could explain uh, the hybrids as a new phenomenon would be, was to check the distribution of the species over the last 25 years. So here are some maps. So this is some preliminary results. We are completing them. So there are some areas missing, but we can also we can already see some trends. Here you can see the white anglerfish. So the distribution 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I was more southern. And uh, as we go um, further in years, you have you can see that the, the species is going up north, and the same is actually occurring in the um, black anglerfish. But actually the fact that we don't have, or we have very little white anglerfish in this area um, compared to the um, black anglerfish could mean that the white anglerfish are, have trouble finding um, mates to, um, to, to, to breed. So they go to the black anglerfish. That could be one of the explanations. But as I said, this is still open and we are still working on it.
And then, um, obviously, uh, after these hybrids and mislabeling um, could have distracted us from the real question, which was the resolving the genetic population structure of the of the species. And um, what we did is that we managed to extract only the ones that were pure uh, white anglerfish. So we and then we did a, a population study uh, on these samples, and we found connectivity actually, as you can see in the following slide. So we found that all the samples from the Atlantic, the ones that were correctly assigned to white anglerfish, were part of the same panmictic population, separated from the Mediterranean. And when we exclude the Mediterranean from the analysis, we also get the same results. So all the Atlantic. Uh, white anglerfish Atlantic is part of the same population. So once we have that, uh, in order to going back to the close kin roadmap, we wanted to see if, um, in order to apply this method to the white ang anglerfish, um, we needed a realistic number of samples, right? A, a number of samples that we could get with the ongoing uh, surveys and analysis done because we need to have uh, an idea of that to see if it's worth applying the method, right? So uh, we did a scoping study for the application of the closed skin mar recapture to the white anglerfish. This is very brief, and I'm just gonna show you two graphs. So uh, what we did is that we took all the biological information we had from the white anglerfish, and we introduced them in a, um, in a program that can give us an estimation of the number of samples you need to get a given number of pairs between individuals. So the parameters that we entered were um, the maturity at age, the weight at age, fecundity at age, numbers at age, maximum juvenile at age. So once we have all this data compiled, uh, we also had to have a current estimation of the population size uh, of the of the of the stock, so we did this for the two stocks, for two stocks, for the northern stock and for the southern stock. The sizes are very different. So the the estimation for the northern stock uh, for of 2000, 2018 at least is of uh, 136 million, and the one for the southern stock is 1.8 million. So a very big difference, 75 times bigger than northern stock. And this is reflected on the number of samples needed to perform a CKMR study. So in this simulation, you see here the number of pairs of parent offspring pairs we would get by sampling this number of individuals. So in the northern stock, because the population is much li lar larger, we would need to sample many more individuals to reach 50 pairs of parents and children, whereas in the southern stock, we reach this number with about 10,000 samples. So you can see here, 10,000 samples needed for the southern stock, 57 samples needed for the northern stock. The lines here are actually the number of samples that are um, measured and weighted every year. So the numbers we need to apply the closed skin capture are not so different from the numbers of samples we are already collecting. This is just the same thing, very same thing, but changing the proportion of adults and juveniles that we would sample uh, each time. So usually uh, when we do uh, this kind of sampling, we don't get the same number of adults and juveniles. So we did a simulation um, testing if we sample the same number of adults and juveniles or more adults than juveniles or more juveniles than adults and so on. But in all cases, the range of samples we need is more or less within the samples we get. I have to say that this study is uh, done as if we were obtaining those samples within six years. So it means that the samples we need, it's much lower than the samples we are already getting. This is the numbers we get per year, and this is the numbers we would get within six years. So in summary, we can say that the numbers we get for, in order to apply the closed skin mar recapture for white anglerfish are actually realistic. So once we have that, this is uh, the next step that would be the development of the closed skin mar recapture statistical model. So here is uh, where we uh, stopped in the GECA project and we will continue by developing the model and by applying the, the method to the, to the species now that we know uh, that it can be applied. So as a summary of this part of the talk, um, what we can say is that it seems that the white peritoneum 
uh, does not always mean that we have a white anglerfish. There are some samples identified as Lophus piscatorio that are actually Lophus pudegasa, and some of them are hybrids. This would mean that we need alternative diagnostic characters to species for species identification. Those could be genetics or other morphological features. Or, and that a certain degree of mislabeling should be considered if uh, this correct ID uh, is not performed. The other thing would be what to do with hybrids. So if they are not contributing really to the population, they should be discarded for the assessment. If they do, we need to monitor what's the future of the hybrids. Um, we can also say that the white anglerfish within the Atlantic are part of the same panmectic population, which makes the application of the closed skin marble capture easier, and which could call for a potential merging of the stocks um, and or at least the evaluation perhaps not the management, but at least the evaluation. And then uh, we can also say that the numbers we obtained suggest that a closed skin marble capture study is viable in Lophius piscatorius. So I would like to thank um, the people involved in GECA and all the people providing samples and many other people that I probably uh, didn't put in this list. Uh, so this is a collaboratory project and the first part of the talk also uh, was uh, done by different uh, students, both stock collaborators and so on. And also now I finished, uh, we ran a, a little bit out of time but we, um, we were considering that as well. So I will uh, finish by leaving you with the poll question, uh, the last one, and uh, we will uh, soon start with the round of discussion and uh, questions and so on that will be moderated by Agurzane and uh, Antonella. So we are looking forward to your questions and, and comments. We are done talking uh, now. Thank you very much. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Nayara and Marina, for your presentations. Very interesting, of course. And uh, now Antonella and me, like uh, Nayara explained, uh, we are going to read the questions that we got through the webinar and try to answer them. So we are going to start with the question from Sieto Berber, where he uh, was asking about if the presentations are going to be shared afterwards. And uh, this was already answered, so, so that the session is recording and it will be shared uh, the video with all the participants. And, and then uh, we also have uh, a comment from Cristina Morgado, uh, who wanted to clarify the role of uh, FK, which is the European Fisheries uh, Control Agency, which is uh, the coordination uh, in terms of uh, control. This was about the presentation of uh, Marina. Uh, I don't know, Marina, if you want to say something about that. It's, it was just a comment. I know, Cristina knows very well about the, the control agency because she, she's in there now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it, it has also a role on coordination. Yes. Thanks, Christina. Okay, thank you. So now maybe Antonella can go through the other uh, questions. Yes. Uh, there is, can you hear me? 
Yes. yes. There is a, a multiple question from John Lapera uh, for Nayara. So I start uh, maybe reading, splitting uh, the different uh, the different question for you, Nayara. So is uh, related to the biomass. So is the first part of your presentation. Um, number of reads relationship that you shortly talk about using eDNA. The first question is, what sequencing technique were you taking, talking about? Is 18S RNA or shotgun? This is the first question. So, I, Antonella, I actually have the, those questions uh, uh, in front of me. So okay, maybe I so, can answer so you, because yeah. they're 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 all connected. So maybe it's easier yes, like uh, it, that. That's much quicker. Please go. Okay. On. Okay. I'm so yes, myself. obviously I didn't give much details because it was a very short part. But uh, and and I'm gonna I'm not gonna go into into very much details. But Jan, of course, uh, we can talk later if you want. I just don't want to bore everyone. But this was uh, this was not shotgun. This was barcoding, meta barcoding. It was not 18s. It was. Um, 12s because it's easier for fish, but uh, uh, this is just details. But what could be interesting maybe for the audience here is how to overcome the biases um, related to the number of copies of genes and everything. So obviously, um, when we do a metabarcoding analysis, so when we want to analyze the community of individuals of, of species that are present in an environment, regardless if it's environmental DNA or community DNA or anything else, um, we have biases, technical biases. So we have biases because no, but, um, the um, relationship between biomass and number of DNA copies is not straightforward. There are lots of biological uh, biases and technical biases. Um, despite those biases, we see correlations. I mean, not only us, uh, many different studies. Uh, and also there are some um, species for which um, those biases have been proposed to be corrected. So there are studies working, for example, on dinoflagellates that have even developed some correction factors. So um, the main message is that uh, some idea of the biomass can be recovered from the uh, eDNA, but of course we should be aware of those biases and be careful when interpreting the results. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nayala, for your answer. So now we have a question for, from Pablo Presa, uh, which uh, he asked uh, if you generate the anglerfish F1 hybrids and the back grosses in vitro, are, or are the differences on color graduality? And if there is a full Atlantic connectivity, why do you calculate plus uh, mass recapture parameters on two stocks? Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question, Pablo. Uh, the F1 were found in the, in, in the wild, so we didn't do anything in the lab, so we found them. Um, so about the color uh, graduality, that's an excellent question, but the problem is that we didn't know we were going to find hybrids, so we didn't really pay attention. to. Uh, so we just asked for white anglerfish samples and we uh, discovered that they were, were hybrids. So in this second round of, um, sampling so we are doing another round of sampling so we have asked the people that are providing samples to take photos of the peritoneum but also of another characteristic that is the number of radial spines or something that are used also as a diagnostic characteristic for the white and the black so actually i cannot answer to if there were differences in color and how to calculate the parameters on the two stocks I give the ball to Agurzane actually because we got those parameters from the um, evaluation. So the uh, I guess you you are talking uh, Pablo about the uh, maturity at age and all those different parameters that we get, which I guess they are same for for the two stocks. I'm not sure. Agur, I leave that to you. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. Well, for the parameters, uh, the maturity parameters are uh, taken from the thesis of uh, our colleague uh, in Jackie King Cotes, who did, uh, who did, I think, a macroscopic analysis uh, on that. I am not expert uh, on that, so I cannot go in detail. Uh, that was about maturity. Uh, even if you can see that with the latitude, 
uh, the maturity, it seems for the piscatorius, it, ch it changes a little bit the size of maturity, but uh, for the moment we consider them uh, the same. Uh, in terms of uh, growth, that is uh, the challenging part because uh, we don't have uh, age uh, reading from the anglerfish. So uh, uh, our uh, colleague from, uh, from uh, Hans Garrison that maybe also is uh, listening, uh, he, they did an analysis of the court analysis of uh, how was uh, this court uh, moving uh, through time, court analysis from the survey and from uh, uh, fleet uh, length uh, compositions. So uh, those are the parameters um, of maturity and, uh, and growth, how we, I don't, how we uh, consider them. Uh, the growth in the case of uh, South, uh, South Restop, um, it's uh, quite similar to, so uh, the methodology is, uh, it's I think uh, different, so it's not based in this cohort analysis, but uh, it's uh, not very different the growth from both. Um, yeah, I think I answered the question. Thank you. Um, there is um, another question for you, Nayara, from Marta Basita Sanchez. I don't know if you, do you want that I read? Do you have in front of you? Yeah, yeah, sure. It is not clear for her how do you establish kinship relationship based on the SNPs. Uh, do you use some specific software? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Marta. Actually, we didn't do it yet because we didn't, so in our simulation was just to see how many samples we would need to apply the closed kin marrow capture. So we didn't use um, the kinship relationships in this study, but we have been exploring different alternatives. So you can do it different ways. So there are very widely known software, such as Colony, for example, where you can use, but you can also use some other uh, approaches. Um, the, the, uh, the people from uh, Cyro, so Mark Brabinton and, and Al have been discussing the different alternatives and there are some reports and and on, on that so if you want maybe i can send you some i think we have the emails from the people right so i can send you some information on that if you are interested uh, yes i think now we have the question of uh, ana rodriguez right uh, so, do you think that having portable technologies to perform genetic analysis outside from a standard labs could boost the applicability of genetics to fisheries management? I guess it depends because the um, in this case, um, having the result in situ and um, straightforward wouldn't really change much, right? So, for example, in the case of the white anglerfish versus black anglerfish, uh, uh, being able to know in the boat if that fish is one species or the other uh, would have the similar outcome as um, having the result one week later and providing it to the uh, people that are doing in the, the assessment. Uh, in, other, in other areas, for example, uh, control, uh, fraud control and things like this, right? Inspection. So when they are doing inspections of uh, e illegal illegal fishing and things like this, having uh, on-site devices uh, there, I see it's very, very, very important. And there are some already uh, developments done in that in that uh, in that sense. Um, Nayara, there is um, a question from Sergi Taboada uh, about uh, um, sponges. Sponges. If you consider using sponges for eDNA analysis. Yes. Yeah, so I guess Sergi is talking about uh, this study where um, they were using sponges as passive samplers, so natural samplers actually. So uh, the sponges will filter water and you would use them as a natural filter. 
uh, I haven't really think I have been following this research. So we use, so for the people that are maybe not aware of it, we, we use filters. Um, uh, so we pass the water through some filters and the, the DNA that is retained in those filters, we analyze it. Uh, in other studies we have been using, they have been using, for example, sponges. And the good thing I think about using sponges is that you can have an integrated view of more time. I don't know how long it lasts, the material in the sponges, but we just filter two liters of water and that's it. But what is in the sponges, I guess, is probably filter, m many more liters of water filter. So I think there could be a benefit there, but I don't know how logistically we can apply that if we want to really establish a standardized, um, you know, monitoring uh, method. It's easier to standardize artificial things than natural things, I guess. Uh, oh, okay, thank you very much, Nayera. So now, uh, Sebastian Minot uh, says that uh, he's interested in receiving more technical information from you. So if you could please CC in this. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. There are a number of comments that are not uh, are not questioned, as you can see, Nayara. Um, there is uh, one question from Matt Lauretta, uh, always for you, Nara, Nayara. Are you able to collect uh, age zero fish, or do you have to assume natural mortality in the CKMR simulation? I think we can we can get age zero fish in uh, in anglerfish. I'm not sure what is the size of the age zero, but I think from the sizes we got, uh, I don't know, Agur, if you have that uh, in your head, but I think we are able to get age. We have quite small fish, so it should be fine. Uh, concerning the natural mortality, I guess this is something we have to include in the in the CKMR model. Uh, how accurate would that estimate would be? Uh, I'm not sure. And how that could affect the estimations? I'm also not sure. We, we haven't started that part yet, but uh, we, I'm sure we will talk about it um, with you also, Matt. Uh, I can make a comment about the... Yes, please. <laughs> uh, yes, about the H0 fish. Uh, well, since uh, growth is uh, a bit unknown, so we made reference to recruitment through length. And uh, so in this case, uh, we consider uh, recruits of uh, 25 centimeters, which we can uh, follow them with surveys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nayara. Uh, for the moment, I don't see any other question arriving. So we are we are a bit out of time, but uh, we we decided that we could extend this for about 10, 15 more minutes. So if people have more comments, for some reason I lost the questions, so I don't see them here. I don't know what I did. Well, there's still some comments actually, very nice ones and also very informative ones. So thank you to all of you actually also for for staying with us and um, your input is very feedback is very important for us. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And I think it's also fair enough to say you can, of course, always contact any one of us if you have any additional questions or suggestions, ideas, which we could maybe take up. That would be fantastic. So um, I guess we, we are there, actually. And uh, I think it was really a great experience. Uh, again, I would like to thank Axti for this wonderful organization. It was really flawless, absolutely amazing. And to all of you um, being there and for the presentations, of course. Okay, from my side, I wish all of you a fantastic day and hopefully we will get some more feedback from you. And thank you very much.